Welcome to Rock Talks. Today we're talking to John Bush, ex Anthrax and current Armored Saint singer. We discuss his latest album, Punch in the Sky, his take on people recording shows with smartphones, the possibility of singing Anthrax songs live again, and much more. Hello, John. Welcome to Rock Talks. Thanks for having me. Hello, Pierre. Hola. Thank you so. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. I was able to take my car in, uh, get repaired, and walk the dog, and still do an interview. So uh, it's been a busy <laughs> one. All right. Sounds great. Okay. Let's start. First question. Uh, Armored Saint released uh, the latest album, Punch in the Sky, almost or kind of like four months ago, right? Yeah, the end of October. Yeah. Please tell me why the metalheads around the world should listen to this album. Sell me the record, John. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, well, okay. Um, it's a very modern sounding Armored Saint record, um, but yet it still kind of rests on the roots of what Armored Saint always was. So um, you, you, know, you got what you expect in the sense that you'll, uh, you know, we're a classic metal band, great guitar playing, cool vocal melodies, uh, great songwriting, sophisticated, I think, um, but sounds like a 2020 record by a band that started in the 80s. Um, so I think it uh, shows a lot of progress. And, um, you know, Armored Saint just keeps slugging it out and keeps putting out records that I think sound like they're of the time. And uh, I, I'm really uh, proud of that because as I said, you know, here we are, a bunch of guys in the 50s who made records uh, beginning in the 80s, and yet we're still here and we're still doing it. And it seems to be the consensus uh, from the metal community that uh, the records are high quality. So when hands down, I thought was an amazing record and, and really kind of, uh, you know, embellished uh, that year 2015 for us. And then five years later, here we are with Punching the Sky and people think it's even a bigger step. So uh, you know, we keep doing it and uh, we're proud of it and hopefully we'll play some shows eventually uh, so we can pr perform some of these songs live. There is a, a song that caught my attention, especially because of the lyrics. And you've been talking about this in some other interviews, but please can you explain to me or just talk about the lyrics of the, of the track End of Attention Spam? What's it, what, is, what it's about? Well, uh, we had the title. It was actually a, a, a title that Phil came up with, which I thought was pretty creative. Uh, it, it just, he, he, uh, it kind of really talks about the, um, uh, you know, how much technology uh, sometimes dominates our life, um, whether that's, sometimes it's for the better, sometimes for the worse, um, but it is what it is. And that's, you know, that's the world we live in now. Um, and I think that I, I touch on whether or not that's making us have uh, less of a capability of focusing. I know I have that problem and I'm not even computer savvy at all. I'm terrible actually yeah. when it comes right down to it. So, um, but you know, people are so enthralled with their, their phones that it's hard to have conversations. Um, you know, obviously driving while, you know, texting is a problem. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, you know, there are some, certain um, pluses to the uh, advancement of technology. You know, example, what we're doing right here. You know, this is amazing. Here we are having this, this conversation uh, through video. And, um, you know, this was like sci-fi 20 years ago. You know, this, <laughs> yeah. Like a, a movie, you know, that came out, you know, that was, that was the, the timeline of 2080 or something, but here we are doing it. So don't like get me wrong. Supersonics cartoon, remember? Right, exactly. Um, so, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not all negative on, uh, on technology. Obviously there's amazing um, feats and accomplishments and things that we are benefiting from every day. Um, I just think that sometimes it's a, the kind of, the song touches on balance and the balance is to, to be able to use technology, but to not let it rule you. And, you know, in that, in that the song, you know, it, it has a little humor, like for instance, the second verse, I write, you know, about the 
people at shows who, you know, are watching their show like this, you know, they, they could be 20 feet from the stage and yet they're watching like this because they want to film it. And don't, don't get me wrong, I'm grateful sometimes that people film shows because I can see them later. But, you know, it just seems funny to me if somebody is watching a show and they're looking like that, you know. So I, I'm busting a little balls and in good nature for the most part. Um, but you know, I do. I do think it's it is a balance with uh, with phones and computers. Technology can can be a certain a, a big plus and a, an aid to your life, but it can also rule you. So you know, you gotta you gotta live life with balance. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be impossible to bring back uh, the concert vibes from the '80s or the '90s, since everybody has a on a smartphone nowadays? Yeah, I think people want to go and just, you know, I think a lot of people just want to go and, and live in the moment, you know, um, you know, I, there's people that want to film the whole shows. Uh, you know, I, again, I'm grateful. I can go to, to YouTube and punch in, you know, Armored Saint, Omaha, Nebraska, and I can find a show usually, <laughs> uh, which is cool. Um, but at the end of the day, I can't imagine being at a show and watching through a phone. Like maybe you record a segment or a, phone, a song, but like I want to, I want to enjoy it. I want to listen. I want to watch. I want to take in the people. I want to take in the moment. Um, live in the moment. So um, I, I don't know. There's also a lot of people that are filming stuff and then they're doing it this way. Like here's the show and look at me at my concert. <laughs> It's like what? Who cares? So you were there. Great. Whoopie skidoo. You know. I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's just it's it's just more of this world that we it, it, you know this thing kind of breeds a lot of narcissism that I don't know if people really knew they had but they kind of do, and um, it's it just is you know it just is. But um, at the end of the day, I think that when you go to a show or when you do anything in life, um, you know, sure, capture some photos, you know, maybe video something for a moment, but live in the moment, you know, absorb the show. You know, don't be so enthralled with capturing it so you can see it another day that you're not actually living it at the moment. I think that's a big problem. So um, I think most people want to want to live in the moment and want to watch a show. I don't think everybody's sitting there trying to film it. Yeah, I, I still have some hope since I, in my particular case, I never, ever record a show with my phone. And I've been to like maybe 200 shows in my life. So maybe it's a couple of pictures here and there, but that's it. I, I put away my phone and enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, I mean, you got to remember back in the 70s and 80s, well, in the 70s, people, would, they would record the audio. They couldn't record the video. Um, and then eventually people would, sometimes they would sneak in these big camcorders and film stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Again, is is. It's cool if you want to watch some old clip of something and you can find it a lot of the time and you're wondering how they film it. So again, don't get me wrong. Like a lot of things in technology, there are pluses. Um, you know, I, uh, it, it's amusing to me that I get, like I said, type in a show and find some random show and usually a song from, at least a song from it, if not a whole show. So I'm grateful for that. But what I would tell the public is, you know, still live in the moment. And that's, mm -hmm. that goes beyond, that goes beyond a rock concert. That goes to every aspect of life. Anything. Live, yeah. in, the, live in the moment. Cap, you know, don't still be so enthralled, like I said, with trying to capture the moment that you, you miss it. Okay. Well, since we're talking about technology, you guys did a, a, a streaming show like a few or a couple of months ago, right? How was yeah, that, that I, experience for you? It was fun. It was it was a good time. We had fun. It was um, you know certainly different and um, um, not like a normal rock concert because there was nobody there except for my wife and Joey's wife and a couple <laughs> of people. Um, she liked it because there was nobody there, so she could kind of have the run of the club, which was fun. <laughs> But um, you know, it to me it was it was kind of a cross between like a, a rehearsal and um, doing a video. You know, it was a combination of those two things because you're playing to the camera because you know people are watching, um, but there's no one in the crowd, obviously. Um, and then it was kind of like making a video because you're looking at the camera again. Um, so I was happy to do it because we want to do something, especially then because our record was so new and it just was coming out. Um, so we were excited about learning new songs and 
performing them, even though we only did it once. Um, I, I, I don't, we haven't really, we had an offer to do some, another one and we passed on it because we just, we, it just wasn't working with our schedule. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping to hold out to be able to perform at a normal show and, and not have to do another um, live stream because um, I, although I enjoyed it, it wasn't something like I wanted to have be part of my normal uh, rock and roll career at this point. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. so is there any touring plans for this year already? Well, there's there's some things being talked about um, now. Whether or not they happen is another story. But there, I can't we can't say anything definite yet because it's just very premature. Um, something came our way, and I don't even know if we can do it, let alone if it will happen. But um, I think people are aspiring to try to have some shows in the fall. Um, I don't know or late summer. Now again, whether that happens, I don't know. You know, I got offered um, to do the. Metal Legion's Rock and Rio show, which was in, I thought it was in September, but um, yeah, again, I don't know. You said know. Rock and Rio in Brazil? Rock, Rock and Rio, right. Uh, Metal mm. Legion's got offered it. Um, I thought, I think Iron Maiden's on it, but again, whether or not that happens, I think, you know, they're, they're making these, they're putting these things together. But again, whether or not that actually comes to fruition is another story. I think we'll have a better idea maybe in the next couple months, uh, you know, with with everything that's going on with the, the vaccines and um, people, you know, and big numbers getting vaccinated and the numbers of COVID, um, uh, people getting COVID going down and it has here in America, which is obviously really bad, especially here in LA in particular, um, it seems to be going in the right direction. So I don't know, um, you know, I, I, time will tell, I think, but you know, we can be optimistic and, and, and be hopeful. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, three years ago, when I had the chance to interview interview you for the first time, uh, you talked about a uh, live DVD playing the entire Symbol of Salvation album. Right. Uh, whatever happened to that uh, project? Actually, it's 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 we're at, towards the end of it. Actually, we um, Joey was just finalizing the the last mixes for the audio. Um, they sound great, really fun. Um, it's primarily from the New York show that we did. Um, and it sounds great. It was a lot of work to you know mix it, to put it all together. So now we just have to combine the video footage of it and then hopefully we can get something out um, in the fall of this year, uh, the live DVD slash live record of the, of the symbol uh, performance. And uh, like I said, it sounds great. I'm real proud of it. There's a lot of good banter that I, you know, a lot of my raps are, I think, are, are funny and they're informative and uh, I, hopefully they're not too long, although a couple of them were pretty long, but it just seemed appropriate for the, the show. Um, but I think it'll be really a really cool thing. It's, uh, um, like I said, it was really fun to do that record in its entirety. Um, we come to really love it even more. Uh, it's a great album and and when you play it all every night, you know, throughout, it, you just kind of realize how good of a record it really is. And it's really diverse. And um, it really, I think, was the beginning of Armored Saint uh, being even, well, I think we were always open-minded about our style and, and willingness to take chances as a band. But I think Symbol of Salvation was the, was the key moment where everything really just kind of opened up and we said we can do we can do whatever we want and take that mentality and take that philosophy and believe in it and um you know i think symbol is the, the ultimate demonstration of that because you have some <clears throat> heavy rockers like rain rain of fire and tribal dance and war zone but then you have like truth always hurts which is this bluesy swagger and you know long songs they tend to pass and another day kind of epic ballad type songs and um, last train home so it's a really versatile record and like i said it kind of it kind of really nudged us to say we can do this and and really believe in it you know we always we always wrote songs like that um, um even with march of the saint you know take a turn and glory hunter mm -hmm. and certainly on delirious nomad with uh, aftermath and in the hole and over the edge but i i really think the symbol was the one that really put it all together and uh when we played it every night it, it just really it was a lot of fun and 
we really realize how great of a record it is. Mm -hmm. So this this will be a this will be a cool uh, uh, product to come out, and you know I think we'll people our fans will really dig it. Is there a release date for this DVD? There's not a release date yet. Um, I I we just like I said we're we're just about done with the mastering of the audio, and we just have to put the video part together. Um, oh, okay. I don't. Yeah, so I think um, I think it, uh, fingers crossed sometime around October. So which would be cool because it would be about a year after Punch in the Sky came out. So yeah, yeah, great time. So besides the live performance of the Symbol of Salvation, you also recorded some uh, songs from March of the Saints, Rising Fear, the other albums as well. Well, we did well because we perform. You know what we did in the Before concert, show, right? Yeah, what we did is it was kind of fun. We did like. We, the set list was uh, March of the Saint and then um, Long Before I Die from the second album and then Chemical Euphoria from the third album. And then we went into the symbol thing. So it was kind of like a chronological uh, oh, okay. order of, of our beginning to where it was. And then and then it ended with Spineless, which is the last song, of course, on symbol. And and then we kind of took a break and then and then we went back out and played like some new songs like from When Hands Down and and you know uh, left hook from right field and songs from the later part of our career and so it was it was a it was a great show i mean i think it was the longest armor saint has ever played yeah. we played like 20 songs a night it was a lot of work Two hours. And for us it's, it was long we've never played that long um which is fine it was fun um but um i don't know if we're going to put those songs out on the DVD. Actually, I need to talk to Joey about that because I, that's funny. I was just thinking about this, thinking, are we going to do something with those other songs? Um, again, this show is, this is from the New York show that we did at the uh, Gramercy Theater, I think it's called. Um, I don't know. Um, it, maybe we could do stuff as like a bonus, you know, something like yeah, that. Like, but I I know. I was thinking about that. Maybe you can save those songs for like a special edition of the DVD. Exactly. Like a special bonus CD, right? Right. Right. Um, I don't. I know he hasn't mixed anything, so um, we don't. Have, you know, he hasn't worked on anything that wasn't wasn't the symbol song. So um, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I, I I don't know yet. So, uh, you have a, a documentary in in the works, also. I think right. Well, that's something also that's going on. That's that's really being put together primarily by Russell, the director. Um, he is still doing some editing with that. Um, um, but yeah, that's the plan. You know, we have a lot of footage. We have all the interviews. We have air interviews from various people who were part of a career through the years, which was really fun. And um, you know, I don't know when that's going to really come out either. But um, that's another thing in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people from Metallica and other peers from the LA scene in the early 80s uh, appear on this documentary, right? Yeah, I mean, James and Lars were nice to talk and Scott Ian and uh, we, just, uh, we also have people like Ron Fair who signed us to Chrysalis, obviously Brian Slagle, uh, Cliff Bernstein, who, you know, from Q Prime. So uh, there's a lot of different people on it and there's some good, there's some good banter between certain people, Max Norman, um, you know, it's, it's not always the most uh, politically correct thing, which is good. You know, you, you want it to be, you want it to dig deep into, into the, into the bowels of Armored Saint, you know, and, and get out some good juicy gossip. Uh, some people always ask me in social media and YouTube comments, why Armored Saint isn't a bigger band, like a more famous band. And to me, as a fan, it's it's kind of ridiculous, actually. Not, not the question, the fact that you didn't go like like the Big Four or some other band from, from the 90s. Because, uh, come on, Armored Saint has one of the best singers and frontmans in the business. As a great bass player and producer as well. And Guns on Phil and, and, and the other guitar player are really good. And you are on Metal Blade Records as well. So that's my question. Why Armor Saint isn't a bigger band? Well, because, uh, you know, nobody said uh, life is fair uh, when it comes to anything. Uh, I try to yeah. tell that to my children these days uh, about stuff. And um, 
you know, nobody said, hey, you're all these bands are going to come out. You're all going to have the same level of success. You know, it's just not the way the world works. Uh, it doesn't work that way in all aspects of life. Why are people poor? Why are people rich? You know, um, sometimes it's not as simple as just I worked harder. You know, it's yeah. uh, luck of the draw. It's inheritance. I mean, it goes on and on and on. You know, uh, why did someone get COVID? Why did someone not? Even though some people aren't wearing a mask. I, you know, these are the questions that you can ask about many things in life. And the simple uh, conclusion of it, uh, for me at least, is that just nobody said it's fair. Nobody said that it's just it, everyone's going to benefit from the same level of success. So, um, you know, I don't get too worked up about those kind of things. I, 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 I think that the most important thing is to just try to uh, control the quality of what you do. That's the thing that you can really be most concerned with. And then whatever happens after that is out of your hands. So you let it go. Um, it is what it is. It is what it is. I mean, you don't have to, I don't think things should be determined by the level of financial success, especially in the world of art, when it comes to music or film or you know, artists, you name it. You know, yeah. that's not determined, I, I mean, let's put it like this. There's a lot of things that are very successful financially that I personally think is garbage, yeah. but you know, it doesn't, you know, I mean, you know, McDonald's for, <laughs> you know, for instance, you know, but whatever, you know, nobody, it's just the way it is. You know, um, I don't think that you should be too concerned. I mean, of course, as it, look, we make music and we want people to like it and you want it to do well. You know, I'm, we're, we're not so punk rock that we think I don't care what anyone says and we don't give a shit if anyone loves it. That's like, a lie. <laughs> that's a lie. It's a lie. I mean, like, you know, nobody thinks that way. I don't even care the hardest core punk rock person in the world still probably wants somebody to buy their record. You know what I mean? Because it, what's the point then? Like, you know, escape capitalism, man. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's just, it, you know, but, but if you do it on your terms, and I think that's the thing that you want to really do it by is do it on your term yeah. and, and have everyone love it based on the fact that you gave everything you had and you believe in it. You know, yeah. how many artists had success after a few records on a record that they probably don't even like, but it was big because yeah. of who knows what, you know, timing, Timing is impeccable. It has so much to do with it. Or maybe it got a bigger push from the record company, or maybe somebody wrote songs on it that other than the band. Like there's always these all these different facets of 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 of, of the business that yeah, a bunch of other factors. Me. Yeah. I mean, how many times do I remember like a few years ago? Well, it's probably longer than that, but um the Grammys came out and Steely Dan got uh, a Grammy for some record that they put out like, I don't know, 10 years ago, I'm guessing, maybe longer even. But it wasn't during their heyday of the 70s. You know, it wasn't one of their like famous records. And, you know, so they got this Grammy and here it was, they, they got the Grammy of this record. But they didn't get any for like some of their more famous records. So I wonder if they were thinking like, you know, but it was almost like, we missed it. Here you go. You know, and to me, I, I really, I loathe that. Like if you missed the opportunity to give somebody a, like a, an Oscar, you know, Martin Scorsese, like, did he get it for Goodfellas? I don't know. He got it for what the departed, which was a good movie, but it was like way later. Uh, he didn't get it for raging bull or I don't, I don't think I, I, I could be wrong with, with some of my information here. I don't remember. But my point is, is that I feel like sometimes people get accolades for something later that they didn't get when they really deserve to get it. And maybe why is, what's the reason? Well, maybe there was a better movie at the time, or maybe there was a better record that somebody thought, well, you know, this is a great record, but this record actually is a little better. Who yeah. knows? I mean, the Grammys are a bunch of bullshit anyway, when it comes right down to it, it's, you know, it's people voting like who they who knows if they even listened on the to the record. Let them. Yeah. They might have said, "Oh, Steely Dan, they were famous. Yeah, I'll vote for them." Did you listen? No. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's just so much. There's so much crap. Possibility. <laughs> right. But my point is, is that it really, you know, to sum it up, is that just no one's a life's fair. You know. So, um, you know, why wasn't Armored Saint bigger? Well. We probably had something to do with that ourselves. I'm sure we made a few mistakes that perhaps triggered some something negative 
to our career. Perhaps it did. You know, I don't know. Um, I, maybe like maybe I said, management too. It could be that. It could be. It could be a lot of things. You know, uh, it just was timing, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but I don't. What are you gonna do? You know, you you can't get pissed off about it. You just have to let it go and 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 believe in what you do and hope for the best and not get too wrapped up in. Oh, wow, we should. This album should have been bigger, and we should have been a bigger band because I I think that's just I think that's the wrong attitude completely. Yeah, I remember but James. Thank you, but thank you. But thank you for your compliments, and I and I we believe me, I'm extremely grateful for that. And you know, uh, you're welcome, man. I'm just yeah. telling the truth. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I I I'm I'm very grateful for that. Um, I just like I said, I don't think it's important, or I think it is important for me not to get too wrapped up in that. Yeah, yeah. I remember James Hetfield saying like some years ago in some interview, uh, the success of Metallica is pretty much being at the right time the right place and hooking with the right people. All those those three things at the very same moment. Yeah, well, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, Metallica was just Metallica, you know, yeah. they- And there are millions, and, of course. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's all well-deserved. I mean, they were- Which amazing. is okay, yeah, well, really well-deserved, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's- and, and I think their timing was really pivotal. Yeah. It really yeah. was. So, yeah. and timing is really important to all those things. It's it's a key factor in, in life, you know, mm -hmm. the same thing with relationships. Like, you know, sometimes why do relationships peter out or they lose some of their, their fire? It's just timing, you know, um, yeah. why didn't somebody connect with somebody else? And, you know, it's timing is really everything. Yeah, it has so, to do yeah. with every aspect of life. So since yeah. we're talking about timing, let's go way back on the time machine to the March of the Saint era. What's your best memory about those days? Well, uh, there was a lot of awesome things about March of the Saint. We were lucky, uh, very fortunate that we started off so young that by the time March of the Saint came out, um, and it came out in 1984, and I think most of the guys in the band had just turned 21. And we did our first tour, which was opening in the States for Quiet Riot and Whitesnake. We did like mm. a month of dates, um, Midwest, East Coast. Back then. It was amazing, you know, and looking back, I always laugh because we were, we had not done anything. We had never really done any touring before that. We were primarily a local band in LA, did a little few dates in Arizona here and there, but we never done any proper touring. And the first album that came out here, we were opening up at places like Cobo Hall in Detroit where Kiss Alive was recorded and yeah, yeah. Market Square Arena in Indianapolis and uh, the Beacon Theater in New York, which is a legendary place. And, you know, we were doing these big shows. I mean, we were really lucky um, uh, to be able to do that on our first album. And we were so young, 21 years old. So I always say that that was my college education was to go out and, uh, and rock out and play arenas, you know, it's pretty awesome. Uh, so there's a lot of special moments for sure. Just making the record, March of the Saint was awesome and getting a, you know, signing to a record company like Chrysalis, which had a lot of great artists like UFO and Robin Trower and MSG and Pat Benatar and stuff. Uh, you know, all those are, are just uh, awesome accomplishments. But I think doing that tour, that first tour, just going out and, and playing the Chicago Pavilion, you know, which is like 10,000 people, uh, it was pretty awesome, so. Yeah. All right, let's talk about a little bit about Anthrax. Um, also, three years ago, uh, you told me that you were entertaining, I'm quoting you, <laughs> the idea of uh, doing a, a side project with Paul Krug, maybe, to play Anthrax songs from your era of life. Uh, whatever happened to that? Well, it just kind of it was an idea and it never really came to fruition um, for various Why? reasons. <laughs> Um, well, probably has something to do with me and my own slight laziness, because I think I would have to be the guy who would have to obviously carry it because it would be my thing. And maybe I was just not really ready to give it to the time at that, at that time. So, um, I don't know, you know, it's something that, um, I would like to do at one point, um, because I do love those records. Apparently those records are going to be re-released properly, um, I think through Megaforce and I think Nuclear Blast is gonna 
put out uh, Sound of White Noise and Stomp as well. Um, hopefully volume eight, there was some kind of some, yeah, there was some issues with that record because of the label originally it was on, you know, fell apart and, um, and, and they were holding it up a little bit to get it relicensed. But hopefully that's all being worked out. Um, so, um, and I have good relationships uh, right now with the Anthrax camp, uh, with the band members and also Mike Monterillo, the manager. So, um, you know, who knows, we'll see. You know, again, sooner than later would be a cool time to either do something like that or something else. But, um, you know, it's, it's certainly in my mind to do, to do something. And I would like to play some of those songs live at some point because there are some great tunes. And um, I was able to do it with Metal Legions on a couple of shows we played only. And yeah. More and that was really fun and the crowd really seemed to dig it yeah, yeah but um you know it, it's there in my mind to do something i just don't know what yet i'm kind of busy with this other thing armored sane and uh, other aspects of life so it's just trying to fit it in somehow some way but uh yeah it, you, you know, actually I, get to talk to paul crook and some other musicians to start the the band Um, I've talked to Paul about it. Um, Paul and I text on occasion. And, um, you know, I, I think I, I really love Paul as a person. He's just a great human being. Yeah, um, really nice. Just a good guy. You know, he's like one of the nicest guys there is. And a great player, great musician, of course, needless to say. Um, and he was there. That, that's one of the reasons I always talk about Paul is that, you know, he was there during Stomp and, and uh, through some, uh, some of Volume 8 because he toured with us. Uh, we did some great tours with the Misfits. He actually co-produced Volume 8, too. Right? Um, well, he engineered a lot of it, yeah. Oh, right. so, I mean, you know, he certainly, I did, the, you know, he recorded my vocals and we worked together to do a lot of that. So it was awesome. Um, and he played some leads. And what he said when you explained that, uh, that idea? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think he would be open to it, as, or, certainly as long as uh, time permits. You know, he's kind of busy doing the meat thing. Um, yeah, but, meatloaf. Uh, Yeah, but, um, you know, I think he would love to do that. And, you know, I think a lot of those songs are special to him because he performed them live. Uh, like I said, we did a Pantera tour. Uh, yeah, we did two 97, 98. Tours. Yeah, and, um, and he was out there for that. So, um, and like I said, it would just be fun. I'm sure it would be just a million laughs because we would always goof around. And, and uh, you know, like I said, I spent a lot of time on the road with Paul and, And, you know, a lot of that was uh, consumed by just cracking up, you know, <laughs> about whatever. And uh, so we had a lot of fun. So mm -hmm. we'll see. You know, these are ideas. And uh, we'll see if, if any of these things can actually happen. I certainly don't want to go out and do like, you know, 50 dates or anything like that. It would be more special if it was just like selected shows. Um, I think that would be, I would make it more fun and special. Oh, well, you're going to make me pay for a fly ticket. Flight, well, flight. you know, I mean, somewhere in South America would be amazing. You know, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. You know, the South American audiences are, you know, some of the best in the world. And I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not just kissing ass here. I mean that sincerely. It's the truth. I mean, yeah. as a matter of fact, the show in Lima, the first time that I think Anthrax ever played there, which was in 04, uh, or five. Oh, five, March. Yeah, oh, five. I mean, that show was off the charts as far as like one of the craziest shows I've ever participated yeah. in, you know, and I'm not joking. Like it was insane. That show was so crazy. You can so, find some clips of that show on YouTube and it I'm really sure, was I'm crazy. Sure. So I'm happy people filmed it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, But there's only one guy with a camcorder, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> But sounds hey, great. I, That was a great show. I remember driving to the venue, people on the streets, you know, it was bedlam, you know. So, yeah. um, you know, again, special moment. And I'm not just saying it because you're, you're Peruvian. I mean, I, that was like an incredible show. Same thing with Brazil. Some of the shows we did with Anthrax in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, just off the charts, you know. Yeah, and the Chilean crowd is also amazing. Chile, of course, a big festival that we did there when we replaced Iron Maiden. Um, Monsters of here. Rock, I think. Was Monsters of Rock made, made him pulled out and, and Slayer became the headliner and Anthrax got in. Um, the shoot, the last show that Armored Saint did in Argentina, the one and only in Buenos Aires, uh, was just, uh, you know, like unbelievable. So, um, you know, it, it, the South American audiences are, are just always awesome. And, and uh, so it would be fun to do some, a show somewhere there. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, sooner Hopefully. than later. Sooner than later.
Yeah, because I remember three years ago, you told me I'm not getting any junk. I have to do this soon. <laughs> well, this is true. And, I, and you know, time is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not always on my side. I say that, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't, I feel great, you know, physically, other than a couple little ailments here, nothing that I need to talk about. But, you know, I feel uh, pretty awesome as far as, you know, being fit and, um, maybe sometimes I feel like I'm in the best condition of my life, but maybe I'm just trying to help myself with that. But, but that being said, I do realize my age. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, be, uh, somebody who's not conscious of the reality of my age. Yeah. So using that as a, as a motivation to say, Hey, you know, time isn't on my side. I don't mean that negatively. I just mean like, you know, you kind of have to move on things because you never know. I'm not 30 years old, it's just a fact. So. Mm -hmm. What's your best memory about being in Anthrax? Uh, I don't know if I would, I would uh, just focus on one particular thing. You know, I think just uh, given the opportunity to, to be in the band and all the years of, of playing shows and making records, um, all the experiences I had, uh, I learned a lot, uh, I, a lot of education about many things. I got to second college. Yeah, second college. It was like uh, it was like uh, uh, what you may call it, going to um, you know medical school, <laughs> right? <laughs> Although I'm nobody wants me to do any perform any surgeries on them. Um, uh, yeah, it was awesome. You know, just uh, travel the world. You know, filled up my passport. You know, those are those are really awesome experiences that um, I was very fortunate to have and play with those guys. You know, they're incredible musicians. You know, Charlie, Frankie, and Scott and um, you know, we just, we, we had a lot of fun and, um, you know, great memories. I always live with uh, the memories. And your favorite Anthrax record? Hey, you know, I like them all, actually. I mean, I think <laughs> Sound of My Noise is, is a record that a lot of people focus on because it was the first and it was fresh. Um, but I think there's certainly moments throughout all the other albums as well. We've Come For You All was a pretty solid record throughout. Um, you know, uh, Stomp didn't get the love from the record company, which was a shame and, and it showed, but um, and we took a chance with the, the company we signed with, with Volume 8, that, that really didn't pan out. But I think there's some great songs. Inside Out is, it'll always be one of my favorite songs, especially live, so. Yeah, hopefully the, that album, especially Volume 8, gets, gets uh, re-edition for this year. Yeah. Because it's really I, hard to find. Like, I you, know. you see that, that CD, that Volume 8 I, I copy? Right there, yes. Yeah, that's a uh, Japanese edition. Oh, jeez. When I found that one on the on the record store here in, in Lima, I, I I I almost cried, man. <laughs> I couldn't believe <laughs> it because I was looking for that album like for years. Yeah, for years I mean, I have, I have I have trouble finding those records. You know, yeah. I go to there's Amoeba Records here in LA. while well, they just relocated, but and they haven't opened up yet. But it was a great record store, and um, you know, I go in there and I buy records, and I look in the Anthrax section, and I can never find any of those records, and it would be sad, you know, for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just want them to be available. Whether people buy them is up to them, but they should at least have the opportunity to get them. So. I think they are available on, on Spotify now. They are, there, you know, on iTunes and stuff. I think you can get them, yeah. But, um, you know, uh, like I said, I think the Megaforce is re-releasing some of those records and they'll do a great job, I'm sure, with it, with the product and, and the packaging because they always do. And um, I'm real excited about that. So, you know, like I said, I just... I just want my records that I've made throughout my career just to be available. That's all I'm asking. I'm not, you know, telling people they have to go yeah. and buy them. Just I want them to be there if, if people want to buy them. <laughs> uh, yeah, because they are available illegally, you know, in YouTube and illegal right. downloadings. But right. uh, the real deal has to be to be uh, like a physical format available for everybody, yeah, you well, know, vinyl, well, CD, whatever. <laughs> And, you know, I love vinyl the most. I mean, but I'm old school, of course. So, but you know, for me, vinyl is still the best way to listen to a record. You know, the, nothing beats the packaging of a record. It's big, you know, you have the gate pulled yeah. along. You know, the, the, you know, you pull out the sleeve, lyrics. To me, that's the best way. I still go buy records and, you know, there's a cool record store up in this, uh, this resort uh, that my wife and I have a place. It's called Big Bear. It's like, you know, two hours from LA. It's a mountain resort and we have a house there. And, 
Um, there was a cool little record store there, and every time I go in, I want to I want to get a couple of records and you know find like an old Johnny Winter album or something. You know, I don't whatever. Um, but I love buying vinyl. You know, it's it's to me it's the best way to listen to music. Mm -hmm. All right, last question, John. Uh, all the time you got asked about the Metallica thing when you were asked to join the band. I'm not going to ask the same question again <laughs> because I'm sure we're bored of it, but I'm going to try to make a, an interesting one. So okay. here it goes. Let's see if you can do it. <laughs> what do you think about the Load Reload era by Metallica? Oh, I don't have a problem with those albums. I think there were some cool songs on those albums. Um, Fueled is a great tune, uh, Memory Remains. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that they were just taking a chance. I, I've said that many times before. Um, Metallica has had this really long career and there's going to be times in your career where you're going to say, let's go over here. You take a turn, you know, uh, a lot of the times. Uh, you yeah. know, not everybody does that, but a lot of people who are wanting to, I mean, look at Metallica has done the symphony records and, you know, they're really cool and just inventive and, uh, I think uh, taking chances, I think, is really important. I, that's what I think as an artist. 